Well, I think that right now, Ginny Sims is very likely the single most recognizable teacher in BC. Uh, having grow grown up in the United Kingdom, she moved with her family to Nanaimo, British Columbia in the mid-70s, where she taught social studies, English, and was a counselor. Sims was elected president of the Nanaimo District Teachers Association from 1992 to 1995, and since 1998 has served in the BCT, uh, BCTF Executive Committee as a member at large, second vice president, first vice president, and ultimately the president who steered the BCTF through the longest ever province-wide teacher strike in BC history. Please join me in welcoming Jenny Sims. to try to sum up the experience, but I have to go back to 2001. In 2001, this government brought in legislation making education an essential service. We took that to the United Nations, to the ILO, and the ILO actually found them to be in contravention of protocols both BC and Canada are signatories to, and they were actually asked to repeal that legislation, which of course has not happened. In 2002, a collective agreement was mandated on teachers. And <laughs> class time. That's, that's, that's good. You're starting, actually. OK, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> and what happened at that time is the government literally drove a truck through our collective agreement. There were provisions in the collective agreement that had gone back decades even to the times before we became a union, because a lot of locals were able to negotiate working conditions even before we legally had the right to do that. The stripping of our collective agreement was such that even provisions where teachers help students evacuate a building in case of an earthquake were removed. Anything to do with teachers or where teachers could have any kind of a say was just stripped. You need to know that we took that to the courts and we won, that the uh, stripping of the agreement went way beyond the legislation, and that as teachers we had the right to negotiate manner and consequence, that is, our working conditions. So we were, of course, glad we won that. The government appealed it. They lost the appeal. So we thought now we would get to sit down and negotiate something. But the government recalled the legislature and they passed what the stripper had done, they passed it as a law. So then here we are in the next round of bargaining, and after 16 months at the bargaining table, nothing was signed, not even one piece of paper, not even one word was changed. And many of these, and we went to the table with a very, very limited number of uh, objectives because we knew that bargaining was going to be hard. However, we made no progress there, but our teachers made it absolutely clear to us that even though we didn't have the right under liberal law, BC liberal law, to negotiate class size and class composition, that was one of their top priorities. So every time we did surveys, did bargaining objectives, that came out way at the top. And so we had our bargaining objectives, and then we had our working and learning conditions objectives. And we took those to the bargaining table, and the employer said it's against the law for us to discuss these with you. So then we asked for meetings with government, because that's the only way we could address our students' learning conditions. And the government refused to come to a meeting. Uh, most of you, if you were reading the paper, heard me say over the summer that I was available throughout the summer Let's have a meeting, let's get a resolution. And back in March, we stood on the steps of the legislature and announced our three goals and sort of said, students' learning conditions had to be addressed, fair and reasonable salary, and our bargaining rights. And of course, none of that happened. We were in bargaining. And you know, teachers are law-abiding citizens on the whole, let me assure you, even though I absolutely believe that teaching is a subversive activity, and that's why we came into it. And um, so, but on the whole, we're law-abiding citizens. We play by the rules. And so we were playing by the rules and in the very limited and what I call piddly job action that we engaged in, where we said we wouldn't go to any meetings with administrators and a few things like that. And while we were doing that, the government brought in legislation, Bill 12. And uh, I was actually in Victoria just by accident. 
uh, for another meeting and uh, found out that Bill 12, uh, that legislation was about to be dropped. And what the legislation did was it mandated an agreement yet again. And what it was was in that legislation, we felt it took the last vestige of rights we had. Here we were trying to play within the rules that the government had made that they were actually in contravention of international law. We'd taken them to court over things, and when we won in the courts, they just passed a new law. And during this time, there had also been an attempt made to silence our voices to say we couldn't share with parents what was happening in the classrooms. And that seemed totally bizarre in a democratic country like Canada. So as soon as the, uh, before the legislation came down, you know that our teachers uh, had taken a strike vote. It was 88.5% with over 80% of the people voting. And we have a secret ballot vote and, you know, every local does that. And people were surprised at the, how high the vote was. But a significant part for us was that we told our members, every local I went to, don't bother to vote yes in a strike vote if it's only a one-day protest or if you're only interested in just making a point, as soon as there's a ruling, we go back. But we also told our members, because we are a democratic union of professionals, and there is no contradiction of that in my mind anyway, that I think you can act as a collective, doctors demonstrate that all the time, you can act as a collective and you can be a union member at the same, be a union member and a professional at the same time. We had assured our members that if any legislation came down, they would get another vote. So within a few days, we organized votes right around the province. And I'd be, I'd be misleading you if I thought the vote was going to be as high as 88%. In my best case scenario, I was thinking the vote would be somewhere between 60 to 70%. Because when you're going from a legal to now here's the legislation, and people know what, you're taking on the state at that stage and then you expect it to go down. And so I was in the building and when the results came down at 90.5%, we were kind of surprised, but pleasantly surprised. But it also spoke to how our teachers really felt about their working conditions and about their rights. It was one of those things when you push people into a corner, they've got nowhere else to go. There were no other avenues open to them at that stage. The courts. When we win in the courts, the government did something else. So what could we do? And so at that stage, our teachers voted to take part in civil disobedience. Now the media tried to project it as a strike. It was not a strike because we didn't have the right to strike fully under essential service legislation, but it was also not a strike because uh, we already had an agreement in place because the government mandated the agreement. So our teachers in that stand were taking part in civil disobedience. And we made this very clear to them when we had our meetings, that there could be fines, there could be jail, there could be horrendous fines, the BCTF could be at risk, and members' personal assets could be at risk as well. And knowing that, they still voted the way they did. And we've had civil disobedience and political protests in other provinces, but what happened with us was something rather unique, that the employer, BCPC, acting as an arm of the employer, actually, but really an arm of the agent, took this into the courts even before we had walked out. And they took it to the LRB, and the LRB ruled that uh, we were in um, illegal, so to speak, and then, of course, they filed those papers in court. So our teachers came into contempt almost on day one. And that's also significant because by the time you've taken on government, the legislature, our teachers then took on the courts and with the courts came enforcement. So by now, you've got the full power of the state. And one of the first things the courts did was uh, they thought, how do we end this? Freeze the assets because what that's gonna do is cut off strike pay and teachers will just go back. And I was so proud of our teachers because as the cameras went to the picket lines, our teachers said this was never about money. This was about our bargaining rights. This is about the survival of public education, our students' learning conditions, and this is about fair and reasonable treatment for us and the right to have a negotiated settlement. 
And what was ama the other amazing thing that happened during this time, and I think it was a testament to the previous three years. By the way, in 2002, when I believed the teachers should have walked off the job, many of our teachers said, well, it can't be that bad. Even though the government's taking it out of the agreement, surely they're not going to make students' learning conditions worse. That's just fear-mongering, and everything's going to be OK. And there was a kind of a certain amount of uh, belief in the system that nobody was going to stand aside and allow the decimation of a public education system. And what we experienced over the next three years, and parents and grandparents and others experienced, was that the working conditions got worse. Classes got larger, less support. You've heard me say all that, and in the interests of time, I won't actually repeat that message. And the amazing thing was we did daily polling, nightly polling, every night. And the public support just didn't go down. Usually by the time you're into the illegality, and the courts have now said your funds are frozen, you're sort of looking at some kind of a crisis internally. And for the executive, I was very proud of our provincial executive because they said, yeah, we knew this was coming. People told us to put our houses in other people's names, and I said, absolutely not. You're not going to have 38,000 people transferring their assets. So as the president, I'm not transferring any of mine. If they want to come after that, so be it. We will take that as it happens. And the other amazing thing that happened was that the union movement galvanized as well. And working people galvanized. And part of it was that I think it gave people hope that here was a group of people who were taking a stand against the state. And many people saw their own struggles and their own fights. But what it also galvanized for me was Canadians and British Columbians' commitment to a publicly funded public education system. And I say to our teachers, you know, uh, we ran the best civics lesson, you know, the largest civics class. And also, the needs of our students was on the mouths of the premier. Remember three weeks before the job action? You never heard anybody in government admitting that there were problems in our schools. And suddenly, the premier, the education minister, the labor minister are all talking about maybe making changes to the school act. Maybe we need to sit down at a round table. And maybe we need to find solutions. And suddenly, they had to acknowledge that there were problems. And uh, the way that things came to an end is that they wouldn't talk to us. Mr. Reddy was brought in as an intermediary. No mediation occurred. No negotiations occurred. There wasn't uh, you go to a table and you present your position. Mr. Reddy wrote his recommendations. And the press conference we had was very strategic, and we're glad we had it. We have no regrets. In regular bargaining, when there are blackouts, you could imagine there may have been a question. But we weren't in a bargaining situation, and the media kept wanting to turn it into a bargaining situation. What we were was in civil disobedience, and when you take on the state and you make the state take a step back and address some of the issues, then you have made progress as a civil society. And for our teachers, uh, we did manage to, uh, Mr. Campbell had said, net zero mandate would never be broken. It was inviolate. Well, the net zero mandate got changed. Essential service legislation has no meaning. It's a piece of paper that exists because for two weeks, teachers took their rights and they exercise those rights as citizens in this province. Third, Bill 12 doesn't really exist because the terms and conditions that were mandated in Bill 12 have been changed by Mr. Reddy's recommendations. And we were able to get money, only 20 million, into the system to address class size and class composition. And I'm urging the minister every time I speak in the media now, the 150 million they saved because we took our political action should also be left in the system to address student needs right now. Because our students can't wait another year while we sit at another table. And we're taking part in the round table in order to affect changes to the School Act because we do need those guarantees. Mm -hmm. And some people have said to me, you know, but these guarantees exist in the School Act. It says an average of 30 for grades 4 to 12. That's like saying I put Charles's head in uh, the freezer. 
his feet in the oven and we declare that the temperature on the whole is average. That's how much average class size uh, makes sense in the real terms. And so for us as teachers, we haven't finished. You know, we t had this motto, kids matter, teachers care, taking a stand. I tell teachers this is not the time to sit down. All we've done is we've repositioned ourselves because we have to continue. We have to hold this government accountable for the commitments they made. And we are going to be meeting with Mr. Reddy. We are at the round table. And I can assure you that we're going to use every venue we can find to ensure our students' learning conditions are addressed, our bargaining needs are addressed, and that we get our rights back. And I also want to tell you that the saddest thing for teachers as they walked back into the classroom, the saddest moment was that we were not able to walk back having guaranteed and addressed those learning conditions in a way that our students would have benefited today instead of waiting for another year. And with that, I hope I've stuck to my time limit. Thank you.